I preach this morning in the name of God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, for six months now, for six months now, we have been reading and teaching and preaching our way through the story. And by this point in the story, you know that there is only one hero in the story. And it's God. The story is His story. The story is the story of the God who made us, the God who loves us, the God who wants us back, and the God who is willing to do anything to make it happen. And our lesson today shows us just what that anything is. Just how much God loves us, just how far God is willing to go. Our lesson today is called The Hour of Darkness, and it tells us the tale of 24 hours. The 24 hours from the evening of Monday, Thursday, to the evening of Good Friday. 24 hours that bear the entire weight of the story. 24 hours that bear the weight of the redemption in the world. 24 hours when Jesus drank from three cups. And the first was the cup of wine that Jesus gave to his disciples on the night in which he was betrayed, the night of Monday, Thursday, the night of the Last Supper. And this cup shows God's great love for them, for the disciples, and God's great love for you and for me. Let's take a look. It's on page 367. Page 367 in your copy of the story. Page 367, the beginning of the last paragraph on the bottom. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. And having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Jesus knew that the hour had come. Jesus knew what was going to happen to him. There is nothing in the next 24 hours that will surprise Jesus. Though the most traumatic, tragic, and dramatic, and powerful, and poignant moments of the lower story are just about to be written, yet in the upper story, in the upper story, everything had already been written long ago. Jesus knew what this would bring. Jesus knew what would happen. Jesus knew what those men in that room on that night would do, how one of them would deny him, how another would betray him, how they all would abandon him in his hour of need. Jesus knew that his hour had come. And having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end by doing two things. First, by giving them an example of what love is, of what love to the end looks like, of what love to the end feels like, of how far love to the end is willing to go. Love loves the person. Regardless of their failures, regardless of their shortcomings, regardless of their sins, regardless of the fact that they will all abandon him that night, love loves the person. And love does the right thing by the person. Love serves. Love washes feet. And so before supper, Jesus gave them an example of what love looks like. And Jesus gave them a commandment to follow bottom of page 368, bottom of 368. Jesus says, Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet, for I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. So before supper, Jesus gave them an example, and after supper, Jesus gave them his blood. And after supper, Jesus took the cup, he blessed it, he gave it for them all to drink, said, so take and drink. This cup is the new covenant in my blood poured out for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this, do this in the remembrance of me. Jesus knew what hour it was. Jesus knew what was going to happen. Jesus knew that by noon the next day his body would be broken and his blood poured out upon the cross. <coughs> And so that they, his disciples, might know for certain that Jesus knew what he was doing and Jesus chose to do it for them. Jesus took the bread and he said, Take and eat, this is my body which is given for you. Take and drink, this is my blood which is shed for you, for them, for the disciples, and also for you and for me. What Jesus did that day, what Jesus did in that hour, Jesus did once for all time, once for all people. But so that we, 
who live at a different time and place than the disciples did, might know for certain that what Jesus did on that day, Jesus did for us too. That we might be just as certain as the disciples were that night. That night Jesus started a new thing. Jesus started a sacrament. His body and his blood given to us in and with the bread and wine. Jesus made a covenant. Now God had made covenants before. The covenant with Noah and all creation never again to flood the earth and the sign was a rainbow. The covenant with Abraham to bless him and all the families of the earth through him, the sign was circumcision. The covenant with Israel to be their God and they his people, the sign was the Ten Commandments. The covenant with David to give him a kingdom that would last forever, the sign was a son. And this covenant with us to forgive us our sins, to give us eternal life, and the sign is bread and wine. Middle of 369. Now while they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. And then he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. God made a covenant that night. The new covenant, the last and final covenant that God will ever make with his people. God made the covenant on that night, and that covenant continues to this day, so that all people, no matter where or when they live, so that all people might know for certain that what Jesus did on that night, Jesus did for us, for you, and for me. It's a covenant written in Jesus' blood. It's a covenant sealed with a cup. And it was the first cup that Jesus drank from that night. The cup of God's love. The cup of God's great love for us. And the second cup Jesus drank from that night was the cup of wrath. Immediately after the Last Supper, Jesus led his disciples out of the city, across the Kidron Valley, to the Mount of Olives. Now, just five days earlier, Jesus had ridden down that same mountain slope on a donkey to loud hosannas and praise, people waving their palm branches and casting their cloaks before him. But this time, Jesus came not for hosannas and praise, but for silence and for solitude. And so he led his disciples halfway up the slope to a garden called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here and watch while I go over there and pray. Middle of page 372. And going a little farther, Jesus fell with his face to the ground and he prayed, My Father, if it is possible, may this cup, may this cup be taken from me. And that is the cup of God's wrath. God is love. And God does love us. The God who made us, the God who loves us, the God who wants us back, God does love us. But the problem is that we don't want Him. And we don't love Him. And truth be told, many of us don't even think that we are made. And that's a problem for God, a problem called sin. And sin separates us from God. And the problem gets even worse because sin is not just outside of us, it's the things that we do, but sin is inside of us. Sin is who we are all the way down. It is the blindness of our eyes, it is the deafness of our ears, it is the hardness of our hearts, it is the stubbornness of our soul. Sin is deep inside of us and sin has grabbed a hold of us and it will not let us go. And the sad, sick truth is that we don't want it to. We love it. And we hold on to sin like it's the most precious thing in the world and that keeps us from holding on to God. Who is the most precious thing? God hates sin. Because sin is destroying us. Sin is consuming us. Sin is destroying and consuming the good creation that He has made. God hates sin, but He cannot destroy sin without destroying us because it's inside us. So on that night in the garden, God put all of our sin on His Son.
Have you ever had the terrible misfortune of having a child or a grandchild who suffers from a terrible disease? Whether it's physical or emotional, mental. I can only imagine the pain. But I've spoken with many people who've gone through that experience. And they tell me that as terrible as the disease itself is, what's even worse is the toll it takes on the parents and grandparents who watch. Who watch that innocent child struggle and suffer with that disease day after day after day, knowing that there is not a single thing they can do about it. And I am told that there comes a point of desperation when the parent cries out, God, take me. Give me the sickness. Give me the suffering. Give me the pain. Only spare my child. Spare my daughter. Spare my son. God, please take me. And that's how God looks at you. As you struggle and suffer with sin, that's how God looks at you. It tears his heart apart. Only God can do something about it. And so God did. He took the disease of sin and he put it on his son. All of it. The sin of the whole world, of every man, of every woman, of every child who has ever lived, who is living now, or whoever will live. The sin of the whole world, the sin of you, the sin of me. God took all of that disease of sin and he laid it upon his son. He took the sin which is consuming us, the sin which is destroying us, and he let it consume and destroy his son himself. Because the God who made us, the God who loves us, wants us back and is willing to do anything, anything, to make it happen. And Jesus knew it was coming. Jesus knew what that hour would bring. And so Jesus prayed, my Father, my Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. And yet not what I will, but what you will. Because Jesus knew there was no other way. Sin entered the world when a sinless man in a garden ate something he wanted but should never have had. And sin was defeated in the world when another sinless man in another garden drank something he didn't want, and something he should never have had, a cup, filled not just with the knowledge of good and evil, but with evil and with sin and with death itself, poured out onto Jesus, poured into Jesus Christ. The cup of God's wrath. It was the second cup that Jesus drank from that night. And the third was the cup of hate. If the first cup, the cup of wine, shows that Jesus knew what he was doing. And the second cup, the cup of wrath, shows that Jesus knew what had to be done. And this third cup, the cup of hate shows, it shows what people did to him. His closest friends abandoned him. His best friend denied three times even knowing him. One of his friends betrayed him for 30 bucks. His own people arrested him by night and condemned him. His own people slapped him and spat upon him. His own people convicted him and handed him over to death. The Roman soldiers mocked him and beat him. The Roman governor washed his hands of him. The Roman Empire made an example of him, stripping him naked and nailing him to a cross with a sign over his head that said, This is what we Romans can do to you Jews. In the lower story, every 
everything fell apart. But in the upper story, it was all according to God's plan. All of it. Down to the very last details. Judas's betrayal, Jesus' silence, Pilate's involvement, Jesus' trial, Jesus' beating, Jesus' crucifixion, Jesus' whipping, even the wounds in Jesus' hands and feet and side, all of it had been written into the upper story centuries earlier through the prophets Jeremiah and Isaiah and Zechariah, through King David in the psalm. All of it had been written into the upper story centuries earlier, and now in the lower story, at last, the hour had come. The son of David, the king. The son of Abraham, the blessed. The son of Mary, the Savior. The Son of God died alone and naked on a cross for the sin of the whole world, for the sin of you and the sin of me. And Jesus drank that third cup from a sponge filled with sour wine. And when he did, he cried out, It is finished. And with that, the word of God went silent. The hero of the story was killed. The light of the world was snuffed out. The hour of darkness had come and covered the whole land. The God who made us, the God who loves us, the God who wants us back, did what it took to make it happen. And it is finished. There's only one hero in the story. And it's God. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God Almighty, we thank you. Lord, you know who we are. You know what we have done. Lord, you know how deep a hole we have dug ourselves into, and we thank you. Jesus, we thank you that not only did you ride into Jerusalem, but Lord, you rode all your way to the cross. Jesus, we thank you that you have carried our sin to the cross, that you took our place in death, that your, the wrath for our sin, the judgment of what we have done, was poured out upon you. Thank you, Jesus, for dying in our place. And now, Lord, as we walk through this holy week to the joy of the resurrection, let us always remember the great cost of what you have done, so that come next Sunday, Lord, we can sing and shout your praise. For we ask it in your holy name, Jesus. Amen.